Thank you, Alan. I come today to share a story about the road I've been on. And I'd like to begin with a little background so you'll know how I stepped into all this. I grew up finding identity in intellect and education and through being a good student. As a child, I was sensitive, sensitive to my environment, to the emotions of others. And though I felt deeply, I wasn't encouraged in that direction. And I learned, as likely many of us do, to value my mind and to discount my heart. In 1986, I graduated with honors in chemistry from Oberlin College. I attended graduate school, and I got my first job teaching chemistry at a high school in Manassas, Virginia. And I loved being with the students and inspiring them to be curious about science. The summer of 1990, after my first year teaching, I spent many days on my bicycle, exploring the horse country and the beautiful back roads in that northern Virginia area. It was a July morning when I ventured out with the destination of a neighboring town called Haymarket, where I knew of a bakery that served a great lunch. And along that journey, there was a place where the pavement turned to gravel. And I don't like riding on a bumpy road with my narrow, tired bike, so I got off and began to walk. Shortly down that gravel road, there was a red car that passed. It stopped behind me. A man got out and asked for directions. So I went to get my map out of my bike bag. And when I turned back around, I was shocked to find his fist in my face. I remember pain, lots of blood, my teeth hanging from my gums, the pressure of his hands on my arms as he pushed me into the woods. There I was forced to perform oral sex with my bruised and bloody mouth. And then he forced himself on me. So there's something about being brought to this place with life held so precariously in our hands that either takes us down or inspires us to persevere. In those brief moments, my mind went directly to a mantra, I'm going to live through this, I'm going to live through this, I'm going to live through this. And of course, I did. The days and months and years that followed were filled with cycles of pain and relief on many levels. My most immediate concern was with HIV. Then there was the post-traumatic stress, which severely hampered my breathing, causing me to pass out in inconvenient places. Nine months after the incident, I began experiencing pain in my pelvis and hips, making it difficult and sometimes impossible to walk. My years of academic training did little to support the emotional turmoil. And I knew I would need to step far outside of my comfort zone in order to get through all of it. I sought healing from a myriad of directions. I was trained in and or was the recipient of nearly 80 different healing modalities. And though it often held in knowing that I could heal all of it and find this place of wholeness and peace, there were those intermittent times when I wasn't quite sure I could make it. In October of 2003, I gave birth to my daughter. I had learned over the years that I did my healing not just for me, but for everyone. I continued to have pain in my hips, and there was something really poignant about bringing another woman into the world that lit a new fire of determination within me to heal at all levels. 
In January 2004, just three months after I had given birth, and in that first week of the new year, I became very focused. I stood in my living room and I said out loud, this is my year of strength. Two days later, I received a phone call from Detective Newsom. It had been 14 years since I had been raped, 12 since I had heard his voice. He said, we have positively identified the man who raped you. So that year gave me opportunity to revisit this experience, to form a new relationship with it. I was asked to appear in court, to face my assailant, and to make a statement. The positive identification of a rapist years after a crime is an unusual situation. The identification came through DNA. The evidence from my case was entered into a national DNA database shortly after the crime. However, not every state was linked in. In January 2004, the state of West Virginia placed their DNA evidence online with the nation, and there was an immediate match. The story made national media. The most significant part of that year for me, and truly the most transformational, came in the writing of my statement. A victim impact statement is a statement to the courts informing them of how a crime has impacted your life. And as I wrote about the impact, what I came to know is that every bit of what had been painful or uncomfortable or heart-rending, every bit of it had given me something of value. And sometimes something profoundly beautiful. Now I want to be clear here because it's not the case that I condone the violence, the rape. But I connected with a knowing that this man, Terry Leon McDonald, who had traveled on my road for only brief moments, had indirectly gifted me with much that I held sacred. It was through this realization that I developed gratitude for Terry. And I began expressing that gratitude through prayer, and through blessing him. In October of that year, I appeared in the courtroom in Prince William County, Virginia, to make my statement. Terry was seated two rows in front of me. And the judge first asked Terry if he had some words for the court. He stood, and to my surprise, he turned to face me. <laughs> he said, Miss Ann, thank you for forgiving me. Those words, for me, were the most important words said in the courtroom that day. It was a profound confirmation of the power we hold when we open our hearts to one another. Without any words exchanged, Terry had known of my gratitude for our lives touching. Terry chose life in prison that day. He told the judge if he were released, he would repeat the crime, and he needed to be kept in prison. There was another blessing that came that year. I learned of Sandy, a West Virginia woman who was assaulted by Terry the day before me. He approached her as she sat on the porch of her home. She, too, was hit in the face, beaten, and raped. He stole her red car, which he drove through the night to Virginia, where he met me the next morning. Sandy's three-year-old daughter witnessed the crime. She dialed 911 and hid in the closet. When I first heard the details of this story from the detective, I had this visceral reaction to how horrible an experience that must have been. And I remember it took me a while. 
And then I realized that was me. It was Sandy's story that helped me to see myself. And for the first time, to hold compassion for what I had endured. This was a huge piece to support my healing. These experiences put me in touch with a strength I hadn't known. And for the first time in many years, I began to walk with more confidence in my footing, more joy in my heart. You see, I had an understanding of a powerful presence that I knew supported me and would undoubtedly continue to do so. There were some other emotional pieces that called to me in the aftermath of all this. The most prominent one was the why. And not in the sense of, dear God, why me? But I had reached a place where I was clear I was not a victim. And yet, I had been victimized. I was ready to take back my power, and in my pursuit to see and understand a bigger picture of what had happened, I was guided to fully embrace or claim that experience in order to discover a deeper meaning in it. So as I journaled and as I spoke with others, what emerged was this. When I lived in Manassas, I had a dear friend named Ted who shared my passion for cycling. Ted had a deep faith, which he spoke about openly. And he was and is one of the most joyful people I know. Ted and I had cycled the roads west of Manassas and had eaten lunch at a bakery in Haymarket. That morning, as I planned my journey, I set intention to find the faith and the joy that Ted shared so openly. And I chose my destination to reflect that intention. I had in mind I was going to a bakery, but there were some overriding powers in play. And when I got to that place where the pavement turned to gravel, I had a strong intuition. There was something down that road I did not want to face. So I actually turned my bike around and headed back the paved road. But just moments later, I felt something even stronger pull me in the direction of that gravel road. That road a voice told me, is the road to your desired destination. Upon reflection, I now know my intention had been heard. I turned around and I took that gravel road. Thank you. <laughs>